Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and with me tonight is Father James. How are we doing? Doing well. Let me get this uh, stuff out of the way here first. Oh, well, no. Father James is moving stuff while we're live, and for those who are not aware, Father James is an Episcopalian priest, and he hey, is a popular YouTuber uh, for the channel Barely Protestant, so it's interesting that you call yourself Barely Protestant. What's the logic behind that? Not actually logic. So it's uh, so I don't like uh, shy away from my Protestant uh, uh, credentials or anything like that. It's uh, actually when I was looking into Eastern Orthodoxy, I would still insist upon being Protestant, and my Eastern Orthodox friends would always be like, you know, become Orthodox, become Orthodox. I'm like, I'm still Protestant. I'm sorry, I still have Protestant uh, beliefs, and they go, but you're barely Protestant. So like that was the joke that. Oh, I see. Uh, All right, you know, I just, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I think the good thing is because you have a, a YouTube channel that's a little more open to at least the other apostolic faiths. And that's what kind of interested me in this interview was particularly people always talk about, all right, your choices are Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, that is, or Roman Catholicism, if you want an apostolic faith. And like the really, you know, non-normy people go, well, maybe Oriental Orthodoxy. And I don't know anyone that's looked into Nestorianism. Mm -hmm. But no one's like, well, how about Anglicanism, you know, and Episcopalian for the United States. But the whole Anglican communion, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. I think, third largest on earth behind the Eastern Orthodox. It's got like almost 200 million people, right? Um, uh, well, about it, 100 million, uh, a little under 100 million. Oh, really? So you've lost a ton of people in Africa. No, no, no. It's always been about 80 to uh, uh, about 80 million, actually, I think. 88 million, I think. Well, you're the expert. You got the collar. Boy, it's got a ton of people. And yeah. a lot in the United States, it doesn't require you to start learning another language. It doesn't require you to start uh, affirming kind of these cultural norms that are really foreign to the Western experience. But yet it doesn't really get a serious shake at it, I think. And so tonight we'll give a serious shake at it, not obviously because I'm evangelizing um anglicanism which obviously i'm not but you are and i want you to give a good case for it so yeah. here we go so let me ask this why does no one talk about crossing the english channel right crossing the tiber crossing the bosphorus why not cross the english channel why is that not a discussion people have I mean, it, I think it is, honestly. I like we get a lot. So I, I'm part of what's known as the ACNA. Uh, I'm, I'm specifically the, the, the subsection that I'm in is called the REC, the Reformed Episcopal Church. Uh, but we actually get a lot of people who are converts or, or you know, coming from different denominations uh, and not just evangelical. Uh, we get a lot coming from Roman Catholics. Uh, actually, there are parishioners in my old parish who are Eastern Orthodox uh, who became Anglican. Uh, so it's generally what I see is there's this huge movement within evangelicalism towards the liturgical traditions, and that tends to divvy it up pretty almost evenly, I would say, amongst the uh, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and the Anglicans and Lutherans. So I've I've seen it. I've not seen this idea that there's not a lot of people talking about uh, what we the term we use is the Canterbury Trail, going on the Canterbury Trail. That's the term that's usually used, not swimming the English Channel or anything like that. Well, I, I like swimming the English Channel because it, no, it's because yeah. twenty two miles. Is, swim, ain't and, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I that, would drown for that. But well, no, you know, you could if you worked out, you could do it. The yeah. uh, <laughs> so the, that being said. It's is it just that maybe Orthodox or Catholics are more loud and annoying on the internet? Because it seems like that's all I see. Or are the algorithms tricking me? It does uh, Episcopalianism have more real world converts? Um, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no. Um, I don't. I, I can't speak anecdotally to what you to what you've experienced. So I don't know. I will say, and I, I especially the Roman Catholics are incredibly loud online. Um, I I will say. 90% of the uh, trolls I get on my channel are Roman Catholics. Um, and it's just constant uh, trolling from Roman Catholics. <laughs> so, like, well, you'll see that a lot, a lot. Yeah. yeah. But that's just numbers, right? Like, you know, it's you're just dealing with there's so many, so you're going to get more of them while there's very few Orthodox, uh, relatively speaking. Mm. And in a parish I used to go to, 
there was a couple where it was a Russian who married like, you know, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and she was Episcopalian. And so they were Episcopalian for decades. And then later in life, uh, when his mother died, then, then he returned to the Orthodox Church and his wife converted to Orthodoxy. So, of course, when you're in the real world and not in the Internet where you have these sort of story arcs where whoever, whatever communion, uh, whatever communion you're rooting for is like on the upswing. In the real world, it's like all over the place because people make all sorts of personal decisions. Yeah, definitely. And, and so speaking of personal decisions, why did you take the Canterbury Trail across the English Channel, whatever you want to call it? Uh, why did you do that? Well, I should probably, I guess, preface it with my own sort of uh, religious background. I grew up independent fundamental Baptist, uh, King James only, all that sort of crazy strictness. And I, I'm the son of a pastor. My dad was a pastor when I, uh, during my upbringing. So I, uh, you know, when I encountered different positions and beliefs uh, in college, I, uh, I, I was a bit of an agnostic at some point during college because of just life experiences and what I was studying at the time I was in the philosophy department. And so I sort of did a, uh, this is thought of as a bad word, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad word, the deconstructing part where I just sort of say, okay, what do I believe? What, what am I justified in believing all that? So I rebuilt myself back up to Christianity, but I uh, did something that I called at the time uh, church clubbing, which was I would visit a different church denomination every Sunday. And I would actually do this with a friend of mine named Stefan, uh, I think you might know Stefan, but uh, he and I, when we first met, we would go every Sunday to at least one different denomination of a church. There were some some weekends and some Sundays that we would go to like two or three different churches, uh, and we went to just everything possible. And he was really attracted to Eastern Orthodoxy. And I remember my first Vespers in uh, in an Eastern Orthodox church. Uh, it, it was uh, Antiochian Orthodox, and I came in for the Vesper service, and I looked at all of the iconostasis. Of course, I didn't know it was called an iconostasis at the time. And I whispered to, to Stefan, I go, look at all this idolatry. <laughs> and so um, I, I actually ended up falling in love with Eastern Orthodoxy from there. And, but I, uh, so I, I started becoming more convinced of the importance and beauty of liturgy. So, uh, and on top of that, became more convinced of the um, efficacy of the sacraments and the importance of the sacraments as central to uh, Christian worship, the Christian life. And so, like, my journey uh, brought me through orthodoxy with that, and I, I became very close to becoming Eastern Orthodox. But I still had a lot of uh, Protestant impulses that I um, just felt and, and believed were still true. And I couldn't hold to those within Eastern Orthodoxy. And at that point, this is about a year later after my first visit to an Orthodox church. Uh, at, at, at that point, I was like, okay, it, I'm, I'm feeling called. I, I sense a calling to ministry, and I've sensed that since I was a child. So if I'm going to be a minister, I cannot be a minister in a church in which I'm rejecting their official proclamations and their official beliefs that they demand that I uh, hold myself to if I don't believe those things, you know? So looking at Eastern Orthodoxy, I was like, okay, I could maybe possibly see myself as a layman here, but I definitely cannot see myself as a clergyman here. Uh, so I ended up uh, looking at different groups, and I, Rome was completely out of the question for me. It's never really been one. But uh, I, I whittled it down to a few different liturgical traditions within Protestantism, and I uh, visited a local Anglican parish and fell in love with the liturgy there, fell in love with uh, the theology and, and realized that this is exactly what I was looking for. And I became Anglican. That's how it happened. All right. So we, ha we have that brief synopsis here. So this kind of connects to that. And let me ask you this and, and sell us, sell the audience, which would be, can Protestants looking for the church have their cake and eat it too with Anglicanism, right? It wouldn't require giving up so many Protestant distinctives and you'd be having something that is arguably the church. So do you think it's a have, uh, have their cake eat it too, or is that a really foreign way of looking at maybe the motivation of someone converting to Anglicanism? So I am looking uh, at Protestantism as uh, there, there are two sort of categories of Protestantism. One, which is uh, classical Protestantism, which would be Lutheranism and Anglicanism. And then the other one would be sort of more or less all the rest. Uh, 
they uh, the 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 rest of those which would be sort of your evangelicals and maybe even some presbyterians and stuff like that they tend to be the representation of what protestantism is but it is incredibly different from what you see the reformers themselves holding to even someone like calvin would yeah. be much closer to like the highest anglo-catholic you can think of than somebody like john macarthur uh like it's just very different uh calvin's theology luther's theology i mean every single for instance just one major example uh every well a, a few actually let me just give a few every single major reformer uh who wrote believed in baptismal regeneration every single reformer believed in the efficacy of the sacraments uh every single reformer used the liturgy uh you know even someone like calvin who did not like icons did not believe that icons were inherently sinful the problem that he had was the abuse of icons, which is why he proposed getting rid of icons, due to the fact that he thought that we had to sort of prune them off of the uh, the uh, idolatrous nature of it within the Western context, uh, and then we could we could slowly introduce them back in. So even things like that it was more of a prudential reason for getting rid of icons rather than this sort of uh, they're inherently sinful type mindset. So it's Protestantism. If you actually look at people like Martin Chemnitz, Martin Luther. Uh, Richard Hooker, John Jewell, uh, John Calvin, even all of them, they, they are, they constantly saw themselves as Catholic. Uh, they just saw what they were doing as reforms within the church. So that that's, uh, what I see myself as within the Protestant tradition. I'm looking at that classical Protestant tradition and I'm saying, I see myself as a Catholic who is reforming within the church. And so is it perhaps not so much like some people feel disaffected and they're looking for something more, but rather you were a quite satisfied Protestant and what you're looking for is the authentic Protestant experience, right? The original Protestant churches were all state churches. Um, the majority of Europeans are part of state churches to this day. It's more in the United States and whatnot that you really get like this sort of shopping mall approach to Protestantism. And as you said there, the magisterial reformers have what you'd say maybe small C Catholic doctrines, which would be very alien to the low church tradition. Would would that be at least one way of looking at it? Uh, it wouldn't be the way I look at it. So for me, the fundamental grounding that I want is to be Catholic and the Catholic the same way you would say. I wouldn't make the small C, big C distinction. I would say big C is perfectly perfectly fine i would just say catholicity is not defined by the papacy never has been never will be so uh you and i would agree on uh, largely i would say on our approaches to the papacy that we can honor it as um you know the first among equals probably or things like that but it is not this position that as it defines itself in which is uh divined uh and instituted by god with papal infallibility universal ju jurisdiction papal supremacy all that sort of stuff uh so i i my, my thing is i want to find what uh, uh myself within the the church catholic and then what expression within that church catholic can i be within and uh, for me, I Anglicanism is the is the best one, I would say, uh, and and that's why I chose it. And it will just so viewers don't like you know being this is an Orthodox uh, audience largely, so they don't fly off their seats. We will unpack exactly the sort of presuppositions or historical interpretations and go into that sort of definition of Catholic. Um, but we are this is not a debate, so we're not going to be like, well, you're wrong for that definition. So that being said, we're not going that topic right away. And I want to ask you this. What is your like response to there being too much th internal theological diversity in Anglicanism? And, you know, not like when they will actually, there's not so much. But, like, you know, what's your actual response? I mean, there's, you know, there's high and low church within yeah. Anglicanism. There's, a, you know, reform leaning, Arminian leaning. There's high and low sacramentology. Um, some want to affirm all the ecumenical councils, others were emphatically against it. So like, what, how would you respond to someone that say, well, that's too much theological diversity for this to be really a cogent communion? Yeah. So, um, I would agree that, uh, there is a lot of, uh, looseness, theological looseness within Anglicanism today. I'm not going to deny that in the least. Rome has the same issue as well. And they're supposedly technically quote, tighter 
theologically than like the Eastern Orthodox or us. But I mean, on the ground, it's very different. So I think that's what we're dealing with right now. So we do have confessional standards. We do have authorities. I am not allowed to reject those confessional standards. I'm not allowed to reject my authorities. Um, what's happened within the past, uh, I want to say within the past oh, almost 100 years or so, is that Anglicanism has um, been affected by modernism as much of, of, of the Western uh, communions have been and has uh, opted for nicety over truth. And so we've allowed for people to sort of push their boundaries a bit and go beyond it. So some of the things that you were pointing to, for instance, like the uh, Calvinist versus Arminian uh, thing, classically Calvin and Arminius were not very different from each other. Um, Calvin and Arminius are, are both Reformed Christians. Uh, they would largely agree that about 90% of, 99% of their theology, honestly, they would agree on. Uh, actually, the, the bigger distinction would actually be Calvin versus Luther. There, there's actually more difference uh, amongst them there. Uh, but I, I don't see uh, the distinctions as big as some people like to, to make of them and think of them. I think our Eucharistic theology would be one where there's a big distinction or, or uh, debate uh, when you're looking at like the confessional standards. Uh, so like our Eucharistic theology, but even when it comes to something like that, uh, both Calvin and Luther, which are sort of our two main uh, Eucharistic theology branches, I guess you could say, uh, they both confess real presence. They just sort of have differences on on how that actually works itself out. Um, and interestingly enough, even Thomas Aquinas agrees with uh, Calvin on some elements of his uh, Eucharistic theology, which is an odd thing, um, like locality and stuff like that. But the point being that Anglicanism is confessional. We have the 39 articles. We have the Book of Common Prayer. We have the Books of Homilies. We're not allowed to violate uh, the, the teachings that uh, emanate from them. We're not allowed to violate uh, the uh, teachings of our bishop or, or the, the you know, authority of our bishop or the canons of our province or things like that. So it's, uh, it's just that we've been loose, unfortunately, and that's what's caused a major mess within the Anglican communion today. So what we're trying to do is pick those pieces back up together and rebuild what, what's happened uh, or, or rebuild to uh, fix what's been broken. I mean, are there some branches of Anglicanism where they just outright ignore those things, where they're completely irrelevant? It's just maybe your particular denomination within Anglicanism that would uh, take those uh, confessions and Book of Common Prayer and whatnot more seriously? Yeah, so like within the ACNA slash REC, uh, again, I'm, I'm part of what's the REC, which is a subsection within the ACNA, the Anglican Church in North America. Uh, we, you know, we, we are confessional. We do hold to the Book of Common but, Prayer. But not everyone is, right? Like, how about the other ones? So what, what happens is, like, the Episcopal Church is, one, is the, the historic part of Anglicanism within the United States. And they're the ones who have gone off the rails and have just gotten crazy liberal. So women, quote, bishops— gay, quote, marriage, all that sort of stuff. Uh, they even had a bishop in the 90s who uh, was an atheist, uh, who pretended he wasn't an atheist, but actually was an atheist. Uh, so it, that's when it sort of got really bad, is uh, you see the Episcopal Church sort of just going completely downhill, and people uh, in other parts of the communion, in, in the other parts of the world, uh, in the Western parts at least, were just sort of like, ah, oh, that's okay, we don't want to be mean, so we're just going to let you know, let those things happen. You know, we'll pretend they don't exist. Uh, while people in Africa, uh, Anglicanism is huge in Africa. Uh, people in Africa, like Nigeria, Kenya, were like, no, this is not acceptable. And so they've been the ones who have helped establish, reestablish Anglicanism within the West. Uh, so they're about 70%, I'll say, of the Anglican communion is behind us as the ACNA uh, sort of helping rebuild the communion from the liberalism that you see within the 30%. And uh, the the screen capture that's used as the thumbnail for this are are, are those guys Americans or are they Africans? I don't know. I only recognize one of the guys, uh, and he's in the United States. Um, but that's so that's sort of like you know how they're like these really small schismatic Eastern Orthodox groups and things like that. Uh, the, the Anglicanism has those sorts of things too. Like the Roman Catholics have it. Everyone has it. So. Uh, if that one guy, that one bishop I know, uh, is like in communion with those other bishops, then it's one of those sort of really small schismatic groups. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So something wacky. I like the one that was doing that, the finger, you know, being oh, a I cool don't, bishop. I have to look at it again. <laughs> but um, 
Well, all right, what's the deal with all the female clergy? That's what people want to know. I mean, you know, that that's a little bizarre to claim to be, you know, following tradition and have that. Is that just a slur? Is this like saying, well, you could find wackos out there that think they're the Pope and stuff, but that's not actually properly Roman Catholicism, or is this actually pretty large? Uh, what's the real deal? So the issue is this, that uh, our formularies do not allow for uh, – they, they, they do not – you could say, quote, technically they're silent, but they, they the standard is for male clergy, whether it's bishop, priest, or deacon um, within the formularies. They don't say, thou shalt not have female clergy, but given that these were written in the 1500s and 1600s. Yeah, it wouldn't have been contemplated. Like, yeah, yeah. So what happens is with the eight, formation of the ACNA, uh, where at this point uh, – so the ACNA is formed in 2008 or 2009, around that time. Uh, 2008, I think. And this is in response to sort of the last straw where they uh, have a non-celibate man uh, consecrated in the Episcopal Church, uh, consecrated as a... Uh, I'm sorry, a non-celibate uh, gay man uh, consecrated as a bishop in the Episcopal Church. And we're like, okay, this is just like... This is the last straw. So a bunch of different Anglican groups within the Episcopal Church break away... And they start, uh, they, they put themselves under uh, alternate Episcopal oversight and things like that from Kenya and Nigeria and all these other places. And uh, the ACNA is formed as a new province in 2008. So, so uh, we're being colonized by, by Africans? Yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. Now, here's Kind of just deserts happened. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, here's the, the issue with all that. Um with those people who broke away from the Episcopal Church, you've got a wide range of beliefs. You've got people like me. I mean, I was never part of the Episcopal Church, but people who are more within my tradition, which is we want to be traditional. We want to be Catholic. We want to hold to the essentials of the Protestant Reformation, you know, that whole line. Then you have uh, people who are more of the evangelical type who are like, well, we just love Jesus and tradition, you know, and women can do anything that men can do and all that sort of stuff. So uh, within the ACNA, uh, a tentative compromise was made, which is the uh, th no women can be bishops. Uh, no wom woman is allowed to be, quote, a bishop. Uh, however, the diocese will decide whether or not they will allow women priests. All right. And so well, how does that work? So so your body does have female priest. Yeah. So. What happens today is uh, right now I'm in a, a a diocese in which no female clergy are allowed. Uh, the closest thing we have is a deaconess, which is a a lay order. It's not ordained. Um, but even Eastern Orthodox have deaconesses, as, as as far as I understand, right? They're, and they're in the canon, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No so laying on hands, though, it's not an actual. Yeah, uh, yeah. Order. No, it's not an ordination. No, it's not an ordination. It's a it's a lay it's a lady, uh, uh, lay whatever. Yeah. Um, so we uh, so a lot of dioceses like mine are like that. In fact, the entire REC, the entire Reformed Episcopal Church is like this, where no women are allowed to be clergy at all. Uh, then you have uh, w within other dioceses, you have some who say uh, that, OK, we can have like deaconesses or female deacons or something like that, but no priests or priestesses. And then you have a few that will say, no, we allow priestesses, female priests. And so uh, what happens is there's that sort of um, elephant in the room. Like this is not something that anyone is satisfied with because the, the pro women's ordination uh, side wants to go all the way to bishops where they're like, oh, the women can become bishops that, like, like that. But then so my why side, don't they excommunicate them? They're heretics. Well, and that, that's the issue is that we're trying to live within this tension and try to work it out. Uh, so one of the th reasons why I prefer – Anglicanism over something like Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism is that I am not wanting to just immediately excommunicate and condemn uh, people, even when I disagree with them theologically. So I disagree with uh, with people who are pro women's ordination uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I'm not willing to say that they're all going to hell for that. And so we're trying to, rather than just be constantly schismatic from everybody who just disagrees with us anywhere and for any reason whatsoever, um, my thing is, well, no, we need to work through these issues out because we're, we are all Anglican and we want to make sure that rather than just kicking people out, we actually work the theology out. So that's what we're doing right now. 
And um, I, I will say, I think the uh, the anti, I don't want to call it anti, but the my side, the side that's pro-historic Catholic orders uh, is uh, gaining ground and doing quite well. So that's something that within, I want to say, my generation, I'll see it get phased out, basically. Do you, do you think the female priest could consecrate the Eucharist? And as no. a follow-up, do you think the female bishops that existed had valid ordinations and were validly ordaining people after them? No, no. No one and knows. so so then if it's no to both, I presume that's what you just answered, there'd be parishes within your communion which are void of sacramental grace. Uh, which is an issue. I mean, they would have the sacramental grace of baptism because anybody can baptize. Uh, even, a, you know, even a woman can baptize. Um, but the problem is that... Uh, the, the point is that, I will say, is that there are very, very few... I, um, Honestly, I might even be able to count it on one hand, I think, uh, parishes that actually have women priests, uh, let alone <laughs> women priests uh, who are by themselves as women priests. Um, usually what you see is it's a woman priest with a male uh, priest there as well. And, and I'm not going to keep putting the, the scare quotes. Please understand that I'm just – when I say woman priest, I don't actually believe that they're priests. Uh, what they like, call themselves. Oh, we call people what yeah, they call yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. 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 Respect it's even it's it's bad enough that you're calling women priests. You know, I I presume how they identify themselves actually, yeah. just priests. Yeah, I mean, they, they, like they'll call those, they'll call themselves mother or whatever, or mother or whatever. You know, but yeah, every single place I know that has women priests also has a male priest there. Um, and uh, so so like there there's uh, I, I, again I, I think there might be within one hand uh, a number of parishes that only has a woman priest. Um, the the idea of female ordinations are actually very pretty rare, I will say, in, uh, in the ACNA. All right, and so being that that's not my 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 dog fight, <laughs> you know, with the orthodoxy, we'll leave that there. And I want to change topic because I want to test how much of the theological diversity we would allow. So what really interested me is when I came across the book from Henry Percival on the invocation of the saints. Mm -hmm. And it pretty much was a very concise argument in favor of the practice of praying to the saints. And he was, he was an Episcopalian and he translated um, the ecumenical councils. He's a famous translator in the 1800s, um, famous scholar. And he even came up a list with certain famous Protestants that also believed in praying to the saints and had a very good, what's that term, uh, florigelium on that topic, which I use and, you know, of course, link to the book. It's open source. So that way people could see it. This, you know, he was fully into this. And so mm -hmm. my question to you would be, um, what do you personally make of his argumentation? Have you looked into it at all? Mm -hmm. So my, yeah, so I'm, I've not read through all of uh, uh, Percival's uh, uh, book. I know the book and I've read through not through it, but I've read uh, sections of it. Um, I will say that, from what I understand of it, I, I like I've I've kind of more or less settled on uh, my understanding of the invocation of the saints uh, in my own theology. Uh, have you seen the video I did on that, or no? I don't think so. Okay, that's fine. So, in my theology, I am not opposed to uh, invocation of the saints at all. Once, when it comes with this qualification, uh, for me at least, if I'm going to uh, ask for the invocation of the saints, I'm going to ask for the invocation of the saints uh, to the Father uh, through the the name of the Son. So, as an example, I will say, uh, Lord Heavenly Father, I pray that you have Saint Augustine, Saint Athanasius, Saint Constantine, Saint Irenaeus, pray for me concerning X Y Z. In the name of Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. You know, um, and, and just so be... Orthodox are where we have a, I would say an analogous formulation very commonly when there's no priest, because only the priest would actually um, invoke God. Um, you would say through the prayers, the Holy Father is the Lord Jesus Christ of mercy in us, and it's a similar thing. You know, um, mm -hmm. you're you're. I think that's. Invoking now, what's it? There's the invocation when you ask them directly, and the other ones advocating them. Whereas I'm like you're just yeah. speaking them broadly speaking, and yeah. so you're saying you 
believe in the advocation of the Saints, not the invocation. But but what do you make of Percival arguing in favor of invocation? Would would you say that's something tolerable within the Anglican communion? Yeah, there are, there are some segments of the Anglican communion that would be uh, very uh, reticent about that. Uh, so, for instance, like there are some within the Eastern Orthodox community who will not even accept a Protestant baptism or Roman baptism or things like that. You know, like it, like there, there's diversity of range uh, within of, of beliefs and such things. So. Uh, I would say the vast majority of Anglicans, uh, and I'm, I'm using Anglican within the confessional, uh, you know, lens. So not just like liberal Episcopalians or whatever, would largely be okay with uh, the sort of invocation that I've, I'm speaking of, or advocation. I guess I guess you called it advocation. Yeah, I think so, I have the right word. You know, yeah, I, <laughs> we invoke the saying. So in fact, of, <laughs> don't uh, slice it. In fact, one of the most reformed of the uh, priests I know. I asked him about this very question. I said, well, what are your thoughts on that? And he said, actually, that that's perfectly fine, that there's nothing unbiblical about that. Uh, we do believe that the saints are praying for us. The The more controversial aspect is if we can directly uh, ask them to intercede for us. And for me, I just want to play it safe. So I think that I can ask God to have them pray for us. I don't need to, I don't need to directly communicate with them in order to have that happen. Um, and I'm not going to condemn those who do. Uh, so, do you know any that do, or or Percival's just more of like this kind of bizarre example that happened to have believed? No, no, I've I've been part of parishes that do that. Uh, my my first parish was fine with uh, invocation of the saints. They prayed. They the flat rosary. out played the Mary. They prayed. The, they prayed the Rosary. There are, there are many uh, Anglican parishes I know of that uh, pray the Angelus at the end of the Mass. Um, in fact, Neshota House does that, which is one of our major seminaries, uh, which is... Uh, now, Bishop on that Grafton, note, then... I'm sorry. Uh, continue, uh, please. Uh, Bishop Grafton, who is great friends with uh, um, St. Tikon, uh, he... Uh, I, I think he was part of Neshota, or he's buried at Neshota, but, like, that's... The Neshota, Neshota House is our seminary uh, that actually used to train the Eastern Orthodox before St. Vladimir's uh, was um, established. Now... I forgot my question. <laughs> That's why I tried to interrupt you. My oh, memory's so bad. You're, you're looking at the uh, debate going on in the comments, I see. I yeah, I'm trying to tell yeah. them, be quiet. Stop, you know, stop being jerks. Stop calling each other names. Yeah. But um, that being said, it's the, let's say, a parish in the Anglican Communion, which is play, praying the rosary and whatnot. Would they still have, like, faith alone theology, you know, how how is it really how would they be much different than a roman catholic parish other than no pope so there are ranges of of uh theology within that so it like usually a a, a parish that's praying the rosary is going to uh be high church uh anglo catholic of, of a sort but they're going to still hold to justification by faith alone um and one of the big things for that, um, I, I'm fully convinced of justification by faith alone. I, I disagree with the Roman interpretation of that, where it's, you know, initial justification is by faith alone. But then every time you commit a mortal sin, you got to get re-justified. Uh, I, I just I disagree with that completely. I, it, it ends up being a sort of laundry laundry list in order to not get beaten up by your wife kind of thing, <laughs> you know, um, the, the, I was thinking the, I was thinking more of like you bring the car into the shop for the tune up and you're the mechanic. You're bringing the car to the shoot. Right? Like, it's, you know, it's misfire, and you bring it in, you bring it in your Anglican priest, you go, eh, 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 all right, you're back, you can hit the road again. <laughs> no, so the, the example I give, and th this might be a little bit unfair to my Roman friends, so I apologize for it, but it comes across this way when it comes to their understanding of justification, is that it's sort of like the guy who uh, goes to home to his wife, and she comes up to him with a list of, uh, you know, things that, you know, did you do this? Did you forget to do that? Um, and every time, you sort of just check marks it off and everything is like, okay, you've earned my love for today. Um, and I, that's not quite fair. I know, but it comes, it, it comes across as a sort of monetization of God's uh, grace, uh, which is why you see, you know, the major issues with indulgences um, being done in the late middle ages, uh, which is a, a consequence of that theology, I would say. Which, by well, the way, just... guys, there's a phenomenal article on orthodoxchristiantheology.com on the history, the origins of indulgences, which literally traces the theology from Judaism and then how it develops within the early church and then it becomes this whole other direction. 
in Western Christendom. So I recommend all people interested in that topic to go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com and check that out. But that being said, <laughs> it's to be honest, it's uh, hopefully my goal maybe a year from now is that there'll be a it would be turned into like a documentary so people could watch it instead of have to read it. But um, but that being said, like on that note, I mean, what would you think of this statement from um, Teresa of Lisieux? She's a, a a saint in the Roman Catholic Communion, also a, I consider I think they consider her a doctor uh, of the faith, like an official theologian. And uh, this is a quote, it's from section 2011 in the Roman Catholic Catechism. It states, After Earth's exile, I hope to go and enjoy you, that's God, in the fatherland, but I do not want to lay up merits for heaven. I want to work for your love alone. In the evening of this life, I shall appear before you with empty hands. For I did not ask you, Lord, to count my works. All our justice is blemished in your eyes. I wish then to be clothed in your own justice and to receive from your love the eternal possession of yourself. So being that I'm quoting a Roman Catholic saint, Teresa Lasso, and that's quoted in their catechism, I, I, is that an objectionable statement to you? No, and that, that's, the, that's, where, that's why I'm really hesitant in condemning Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy is that what often happens is uh, – like the big debate for me is not justification, honestly. I don't think that's the debate. Uh, like that was the debate during the uh, – you know, the Reformation. And I think at that time it does make sense for that debate, but especially like post Vatican II, Rome has really tried to get as close to faith alone uh, as they can get without actually admitting faith alone. Um, like without selling out their base, you know, you can't yeah, do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, like, so for me, I'm not like, those are not the debates I tend to be having. That's why you, you'll never really see me debate. So a, a Roman Catholic on just like, I, I saw Dr. Jordan Cooper, who's a Lutheran, his debate with uh, Jimmy Aiken, who's Roman on uh, faith alone uh, and justification. And I was just like, you guys like, wait, oops, sorry, within the, within each tradition, you're able to get close enough to each other to where like there, there are very few practical distinctions between the two. Because for me, for, for my side, for instance, when we say faith alone, we're not saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Heck yeah. Maybe those Episcopalians are saying yeah. that. <laughs> no. um, what happens is with, uh, like within the reform tradition especially, is that there is this understanding that works are a necessar necessary outpouring of genuine faith. Um, and we're actually told to look at our fruits. And now, and actually what happens within the reform tradition is you get like the, uh, the Puritans who get so obsessed with like the, the, the fruit works of, of faith that, um, they end up becoming like medieval Roman Romanists and that, you know, like, Oh, I thought a bad thought yesterday. Therefore I must, uh, you know, read, uh, all 150 Psalms in one day and pray them. Uh, or else I will burn in hell. Kind of like th there's that sort of crazy pietist uh, Puritan mindset. Uh, so the best of Roman theology is almost indistinguishable from faith alone, I would say. And uh, the best of Protestant theology understands that works are a necessary outpouring of a genuine faith. And there's debates in this channel, the people do orthodoxy, so we won't get into that now. But let me ask a clarifying question that's on this topic. Can Anglicanism allow for all Orthodox or Roman Catholic distinctives, for example, the seven ecumenical councils, with the condition that adherence to these is not mandatory? Because, like, for example, I think it was around 1720, there was possible uh, union efforts between the Greek Orthodox and the Anglicans. And it was specifically, that was one of the things that they couldn't, you know, they couldn't agree upon was that the Orthodox say, well, you have to accept these seven councils. And the Anglicans were like, eh, I can't do that. And so it would seem to me they will not allow it to be mandatory. Yeah. But are people allowed to, within that communion, say, well, in this parish it's mandatory. We just tolerate, you know, mother's superior in the other parish who doesn't have that. <laughs> That's an interesting point. I guess it would work maybe like that. It could work on that on the di diocesan level. So um, for us, the, so there are sort of three fundamental levels of, of the church. There is the individual, 
um, who is baptized as a Christian who's who's part of the church, uh, the part of the church Catholic. Then there's the diocese under the bishop, which is a, another fundamental part of the church Catholic and the entirety of the church Catholic. Uh, so we would see those three fundamentals. And so within the diocese, I guess you could have canons like that where they say, well, within our diocese, you, it's mandatory to understand. And I've seen actually parishes or dioceses that do this. Uh, not this exact thing, but uh, things like that, where it's mandatory to understand that the Seventh Ecumenical Council was rightly uh, believed, and that we need to hold to the um, the goodness of iconography and things like that. And honestly, like I don't know a single Anglican uh, who is opposed to iconography. <laughs> um, they might have issues with like things like veneration and such, but every Anglican parish you go to is going to have iconography in it uh whether it's stained glass windows or i mean i know statues are not technically iconic. But, but being that some do the rosary some will kiss icons uh you know venerate them pray pray to icons or, or statuary no. i presume because it's anglicanism when, when it comes to uh veneration it it really depends on what's being meant by that so for instance one of the practices within even um reform the reformed anglican tradition uh is uh whenever we pass the altar we uh, bow to it, all right? It's just a, a, a it's a slight bow. Um, and we always receive communion kneeling. We never receive communion stand, well, unless we have to because of just the logistics of it. But the standard is uh, the we, we receive communion kneeling. Uh, in fact, I never receive communion standing. I always kneel. Um, so we have these sorts of practices, and one could call that veneration. In fact, uh, uh, Jeremy Taylor, uh, uh, I think 1600s or so, uh, so before like the the sort of tractarian movement and all that jeremy taylor starts talking about how the you know about the goodness defending the practice of the veneration of the altar by by our bowing before it and, uh, and genuflecting before it and things like that uh so if that can be applied to iconography uh in that sense yeah i i think that that's appropriate uh but i th one of the issues i think is that i don't want uh to go into sort of the uh i don't want to go too far when it comes to things like uh veneration i guess you could say is, but is there anyone that goes too far by your standards like so for example um on sunday unless the kids run in the muck and i don't get the opportunity to go up to the icon i could go up to the icon on the theotokos i could kiss the icon i could put my forehead in the icon i could pray to the theotokos um, it's a gorgeous icon. Um, you know, you could meditate upon, you know, the Theotokos uh, on the iconostasis in front of this icon. And so would, would there be anyone doing that at all? Because that's properly, let's say, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, what it teaches. Is there anyone who does that at all? Or is that anathema everywhere in Well, I do. Anglicanism? I do most of that myself. So yeah, I do most of that myself. Um, I, I have my own iconography. Uh, I have a, a prayer corner with, with a variety of icons. I've kissed my icons before. I've, I've done all those sorts of things. Um, when I was at Pasca, I, I try to make Pasca every single year because uh, I just I love going celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. So I mean, I, I was at who wouldn't want to go to a party? You know, the three a.m. in the morning and there's booze afterwards. Amen. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's college life for you. Come on. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, I was at a Rocor church actually. Um, with a friend they have booze. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. quota monk in Jordanville, we can have vodka on wine days. Well, what do you mean? It's got alcohol on it. It's not made of grapes. <laughs> so, all right, continue. <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, I, I kissed the icon there, and, uh, you know, I, like, I I love iconography. Um, I just, so, like, the, and, oh, I'll give another example. One of the uh, common practices, uh, uh, maybe not necessarily common practices, but it's not, un, it's not, weird or anything for within anglicanism is uh during uh the good friday service uh somebody will carry in the cross obviously not really the cross but you know like a, a life-size cross kind of thing and we will venerate kiss uh uh before the cross like uh, my my first parish that i was a part of that was a part of our uh holy week where um we would go to the cross and we would kiss and pray uh before it and all that and that's just so really so random. so that it's not that it's common, but there there would be Anglicans like yourself that you know would kiss their icon of the Theotokos, and some that are, who are maybe more comfortable actually invoking the saint, perhaps praying to the saint when yeah. doing that. So that'd be the full Orthodox practice in that event. Yeah. Um, 
All right, that, that is very interesting. And um, let me ask this follow-up question then. So we said, well, there's that diversity. Obviously, not everyone does it. But has, in your opinion, this is your opportunity now to defend the notion, has the church historically operated this way where we'd have such diversity on a question like that, right? Like you'd have people saying it's, I, it's uh, what's that term? Idolatry for someone to do that. And then you'd have someone within the same community say, no, I do that all the time. Well, we do see some differences within the early church on on a variety of things. Um, I mean, there are some. It's a minority position, but there are some who are opposed to iconography within the early church. Uh, and again, remember, my position is not uh, opposition to iconography. Uh, I'm not at all opposed. In fact, I again, I don't think, I don't think I know a single uh, clergyman within Anglicanism who is opposed to iconography in and of itself. Um, and again, every parish I've ever been to has iconography. So you know things like that. Uh, like you'll have in the early church one or two uh, uh, early church fathers who will actually be opposed to iconography just in toto. Um, but like saying uh, so, Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, some like that. Uh, that for me, um, I like my, part of my conviction of being okay with iconography is the Seventh Ecumenical Council. I'm convinced by their uh, understanding. Like I think that iconoclasm is uh, a Christological heresy, for instance. Like I actually do, but like the idea of being opposed to iconography, like in and of itself, is a Christological heresy, uh, because uh, especially when, obviously concerning Jesus himself, uh, because it is the mixing of the two natures. You know, like I would say an icon, like an icon depicting the Father, I think would be uh, uh, wrong, uh, because the icon, uh, but because the Father is not does not have a body, right? You would agree with me on that, right? I that would agree with you. Like and, 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 uh, yeah. I, this kind of a third rail a little bit. Um, I know, I don't let me just make a, I'll make a quick comment on it, just so people are aware. Um, there's a canon in the Council of Moscow, 1666, which forbids icona, um, iconographic uh, depictions of the Father. And there's some people that say, well, this is like only a hyperdox position you'll see in the internet, um, because you will find icons the father in certain monasteries and whatnot they were particularly popular in russia in like the 1800s yeah. um but but that being said if you really understand in my view the view of the damascene and his defense of icons and if you're in the russian orthodox tradition you're bound in my opinion by the canon right like you don't determine your canons and whether you follow them out we that, i mean that's a canon we have um i would say well this is a canonical view and so uh, canons of the Father otherwise would be non-canonical. And we have saints into the 21st century. I consider I consider new martyr Daniel Sezoyev a saint who outright forbids, you know, icons of the Father. So I believe the saints, whenever they discuss the issue, are not so accommodating on it. And I find that to be morally safer. But without, like, having done a ton of research on it, I just leave it there. Because it kind of connects to this. I uh, Father Theodore in holy trinity monastery said yeah technically the icons of father are wrong and the problem is uh, i don't want to get the name wrong but father cyprian painted icons to father all over the place there right stained the holy trinity so he said but they exist throughout the orthodox world and there's icons that work miracles and so we can't say this is totally horrible because then why would they exist everywhere and why do they work miracles now of course when he's just making the comment, I didn't see any citations or anything, so I'll leave that to others to investigate um, Father Theodore's observation. I'm not saying I doubt it. It would be perhaps one of those things where, well, how do you correspond to experience with canons and, and explicit written things written by saints? And it's an issue I'd have to research more. But it reminds me of this question for you. Is there any icons or art or statuary that works miracles or does miraculous things in the Anglican communion? Because that's like one of the things that all the other apostolic churches believe in. Yeah. You know, um, weeping icons, um, the Roman Catholics tend to have some pretty like gory miracles, like bloody these, bloody that. Uh, is there anything, any sort of equivalent in well, Anglicanism? Yeah, there there are some things like that. So for instance, uh, Bishop Grafton's body is an incorruptible uh, as one example. Uh, I, I, I've... Uh, I've, uh, I would love to one day be blessed with this, but I know priests who have had various uh, Eucharistic miracles happen within their context. Um, 
I want to say about uh, I, I I can think right now of two or so that have happened, uh, and there, I I know that there are more, but I'm just remembering two specifically right now. Um, and then I, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. We can look at historical, I guess you could say, miracles, but but not having specifically the same exact route that we're looking at right now as like with relics and, and iconography and such. I don't know of any icon uh, iconographic ones. Uh, but one of the things about Anglicanism is we're very big on the right usage of things. So, for instance, if Rome uh, comes across, say, a bleeding host or something like that, what are they going to do? They're definitely not going to consume it. They're going to put it in a little bag and put it in one of their reliquaries or whatever and show it. And it'll be there for hundreds of years. I, and I've been to these places where they, they have them. It's like, you know, look at this bleeding host from, you know, A.D. 1738. And this is from France and all, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, that's not why Jesus gave us uh, communion. That's not why he gave us the Eucharist. The point of the Eucharist is uh, what Jesus tells us. He goes, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Uh, this is my blood, which was uh, uh, shed for you. So for us, it's like, okay, this is great, and uh, let's now consume it, because that's what Jesus told us to do. So we don't sort of do preservations of, like, the Eucharist in that sort of sense. Not that we never have uh, uh, the Eucharist in, uh, uh, you, know, you know, held and preserved and all that. I mean, we have to take it to the sick and things like that. But uh, our thing is, okay, this, is, this might be a miracle. This is great. Let's eat it now, uh, but because that's what Jesus told us to do. And so you're saying with an Anglican communion, they have bloody hosts, like, and then they, they, they just eat it? Yeah, I, I mean, my, I, I'm not sure if it's, like, gone to the bloody host part. Uh, sort of the miracles that I've seen have not been bleeding, or not seen, but uh, been told about, have not been about bleeding hosts, but about sort of um, angelic visitations and things like that. Oh, okay. So, so like, the appearance of angels during the liturgy, something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, things like that. The um, Now, let me ask this question. I sort of touched on it. But maybe just to discuss more broadly, I mean, do you feel that the early church allowed for more diversity and the more restricted, rigidly canonical approaches to Christianity we see in Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, etc., are something that's of a later development? Uh, let me give you an opportunity to at least defend that notion. Okay. Here you go. Oh, I thought you said for you to defend You that. to defend the notion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to defend that. <laughs> So um, within the early church, again, like, like I said before, we do see a bit of diversity on a variety of beliefs. and uh, But we also see really strict things. So obviously the Court of Decimate controversy in the second century, uh, Irenaeus is much more liberal, quote liberal on that, than uh, what was it, Pope Stephen or Pope Victor? Who was it? Pope, I don't remember. Uh, but the Pope who was trying to excommunicate them and condemn them. Victor, yep. Yeah, it was Victor, okay excommunicate and condemn them. Uh, so uh, there are diversities of opinions. There are things that are adiaphora. I don't know if I am comfortable to say that they are more strict or more loose than what we see within orthodoxy or within Romanism today. Uh, so I would say that uh, confessional Anglicanism, the Anglicanism that I want to defend, so no women ordinations and things like that, uh, I would say that we would probably be about sort of the healthy diversity of opinions that you see within the patristics and such. Uh, so you do see a diverse range of beliefs concerning the Eucharist, for instance. And we have we allow two major positions within uh, our Eucharistic theology. And I would say, broadly speaking, that you find those two positions within the uh, patristics as well. Uh, baptismal regeneration, we're supposed to believe the same thing. Uh, so we believe what the universal church has taught for that all the time. So we don't we don't allow for differences on that. Um, confessionally, again, uh, uh, on the confessional standard. Uh, I mean, you see different liturgies. There are various liturgical rites. Uh, we keep to, uh, broadly speaking, one rite, uh, which is a subset of the Latin rite in English or whatever the, the vulgar language is for, for there. Uh, I mean, again, when we're talking about sort of confessional Anglicanism, I don't see the diversity that a lot of people like to portray upon it again there are liberal elements that we're trying to purge out of it but i like if i'm going to leave a church just because i'm dissatisfied with liberal uh, beliefs within it i'm not going to find a church um i'm, I'm just not like even within eastern orthodoxy 
uh, I'm going to find liberal elements within there that are tolerated. Uh, and I mean, honestly, when I when I chose to not become Eastern Orthodox, part of it was so, for instance, the sort of uh, okayness with uh, universalism. I'm like, I'm sorry, I cannot hold to universalism. And there's a, there are a lot of Eastern Orthodox elements that are okay with universalism. So no like, saying, Spot. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. no. I'm, I'm, and, and, again, <laughs> and again, I'm not trying to say that, uh, like, please don't take me wrong. I love Eastern Orthodoxy, so I'm not trying to say that you guys are just a bunch of liberal compromisers. But, like, there are those. But there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Let's be honest. Yeah. So, like, the, you know, the, there's those sorts of things. Again, I can't be like, I need to find the perfect church that agrees with me fully. Uh, like that's not the approach St. Paul takes. He doesn't say, "Oh, there are these problems in the Church of Corinth, excommunicated, you're all gone, goodbye." I mean, he I got a sort of insensitive yeah. joke. You ready? Yeah, go ahead. Choose Anglicanism. It's good enough. It's good enough. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> no, and like, and that's the thing for me is that I can, as an Anglican, uh, the positive reasons I'm an Anglican are the prayer book, for instance. Like people tell me, why are you why are you Anglican uh, and like you know why aren't you Eastern Orthodox or why aren't you Roman Catholic? I'm like, the reason I'm not Eastern Orthodox and the reason I'm not I'm not Roman Catholic and the reason I'm not Lutheran is that I'm Anglican. So like for me, it's like I want to talk about what I love about Anglicanism. And so the prayer book tradition is just amazing. Uh, I mean, everyone steals the prayer book tradition from us. They like everyone copies from it. Like the evangelicals are trying to do liturgy, they copy from it. Whenever someone is trying to do a Western rite, for instance. Uh, I think St. T. Cons uh, bar uh, borrows elements, a lot of elements from the uh, from the prayer book tradition, from our prayer book tradition. Uh, the Roman Catholics made the Anglican Ordinariate, which uses basically our prayer book tradition and tries to copy. Like it is the most, I would say it is without uh, question, the most beautiful liturgy uh, out there. Like I love and I've, I've witnessed a lot of liturgy, St. Basil's. Uh, say uh, John Chrysostom's, the Roman Rite, the you know tra Trad one, the Novus Ordo, all of it. I mean, I've seen so many different liturgies, and for me, it's still the the Book of Common Prayer that is the most beautiful. All right, so we have uh, this question, which I wrote during work, so you're not prepared for it, and you can say pass. Oh. But I think it needs to be asked because it kind of unpacks right. your doctrine of the Church. What's your response? To those who call Anglicans schismatics, and the follow-up to that be is, what is your understanding of schism? So, uh, we are not schismatics in the context of the Reformation. The Reformation, what simply happened was that we declared that the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm of England. And... I mean, we still hold by that today. And obviously, England now going beyond that. Like, basically, he does not have universal jurisdiction. So if that makes us schismatic, then what that means is that we have to give in to the Roman claims to begin with. Right? So right. you could be more broadly schismatic by not being community of the Orthodox if they never went to schism by that right. logic. But so you're saying from your geo geocentric view – would be well no the roman catholic church was one church and we they don't have immediate jurisdiction over here and so our bishops do whatever they want no so my, my position is this uh the the claims in the past of roman you know supremacy papal supremacy and all that sort of stuff just are not true so we don't have to submit ourselves to that uh jurisdiction now that should have been recognized and said, oh, yeah, actually, we don't have that uh, jurisdiction. We don't have that authority to do so. And then things could have gone better, right? Uh, that's instead what happened instead was that we were excommunicated. So we are not the schismatics because we did not excommunicate, right? And so then are you going to say then the Roman Catholics are in schism? Yes. They're schismatics. They are schismatics. Then isn't there salvation in jeopardy, or you would not hold to schism being that serious of a sin? Uh, no, I think I think uh, schism is a serious sin. To, uh, actually, whichever way you think about it, is it's a serious sin. Uh, someone has sinned seriously, I will say. Um, and so what happens is this. Uh, with schism, that does not invalidate your sacraments. All right. I would not take the sort of uh, 
kind of St. Cyprian of Carthage, although I think it goes even beyond what he was uh, sort of arguing, uh, understanding of the church being unable to schism. And, you know, if, if, if it does schism, then one is no longer one side is no longer the true church and all that sort of stuff. And the reason I, I reject that sort of theology is that what do we see within the New Testament? Uh, St. Paul's talking to, um, uh, was it Col the Colossians or the Corinthians? I don't remember. And talking about how there are different sects within uh, Yeah, it's in 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1 Corinthians. And, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of uh, uh, Apollos and all that sort of stuff. And they are schisms. They are like they are schisms within the church. But he doesn't condemn any of them and say that, okay, you're no longer part of the church. You're no Like he still refers to them as part of the church and points out to their baptism. <laughs> points to their baptism saying you're one um despite what they say so when i think of the church being unable to be actually in schism my my b belief on that is we can say whatever we want but at the end of the day we're still united by one baptism so anyone who is validly baptized does not lose that valid baptism even if they apostatize it's just that they are in just much more trouble with god <laughs> when uh, than someone unbaptized i would say and so, so it would seem that you would think schism of being a sinful for the person who starts it, the person that's purposely follow, you know, propagating it. What do you make of the person like St. Ignatius of Antioch says that those who follow those are going to schism will not inherit the kingdom of God? Like, uh, how would you interpret that? Yeah, I, I think it has to be looked uh... – uh, I'd have to look at the context of it. So, but knowing Saint, uh, you said it was Saint Athanasius, right? Saint Ign Ignatius of Antioch. Oh, Ignatius. Oh, of Antioch. Okay. Yeah. yeah I don't think. Okay. So, looking at his, um, I, I think what happens is we often uh, looking at his epistles. I think what happens often is that we sort of apply twenty first century situations, or even you know sixteenth century or eleventh century situations, onto uh, early second century like letters that are just being written while he is on his way to being execu uh, ex uh, executed. So for instance, um, let's say I, um, would you give me the exact quote again? Was it? Uh, he, he said that those who follow those who go into schism will not hurt the kingdom of God. Okay. Um, you can say I don't have it in front of me. We'll, you know, don't have to yeah. talk about it. But um, so with something like that, I don't think that if, for instance, two bishops are fighting, um, because if we're going to take that super literally, then there's no repentance from it. Because if you, like, if you even follow for one second that bishop who schisms, even if he repents a day later and comes back, uh, you know, well, sorry, that one person who followed him uh, into schism for that one 24-hour period who then comes back and repents, too bad. But it's not following him anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but even if he repents and comes back kind of thing. Like, I, I think what happens is we tend to take these sorts of uh, off-the-cuff sta statements from uh, fathers and literally and so sort of this is applying to every – like, they don't think that way. The, the fathers do not think that way where, like, when I make a statement, I am thinking of every single logically possible situation in which, you know, the statement is being made. When they're talking about schismatics, they're talking about people like the proto-gnostics of the time you know, the uh, uh, Marcionites and things like that. So I don't think sort of people having a tussle and excommunicating each other um, that like the people who follow either of those bishops are just going to hell as well kind of thing. I don't think that like if, if that were the case, then we'd have to say some of the people in like Ukraine or, or Russia, uh, like on, at least on one side of that debate, like everyone is going to hell there, you know. Because well, there's a something schism. to be said about that. So <laughs> that aside, um, what's your response to those that think what you are essentially asserting here is ecumenism? Is that even like a bad thing, you know, from your perspective? Well, it depends on what's meant by ecumenism. I don't like the sort of 20th century ecumenism because it's compromise of, of meaning like, you know, everyone's Buddhist and this and that. But how about like yeah. Christian, you know, how about within the realm of Christendom? No, 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 I'm talking about within the realm of Christendom. See, that that one wouldn't even be ecumenical, uh, ecumenism. It's, uh, I don't remember the word for it, but uh, the point being that, so the ecumenism I am not in favor of is the compromising of our uh, standards and pretending that we don't have differences amongst each other, right? So I am wholly opposed to that, and I think that it, that isn't heresy. It is isn't heresy uh, because it's compromise. It's saying that actually theology doesn't matter. The sort of ecumenism I can get behind is that, so I'll give a, a really close example. 
Uh, Lutherans and Anglicans are like really, really close in our theology. We're very similar in our theology. So as a priest within the Anglican tradition, I am perfectly fine with a Lutheran coming to receive communion at my uh, at my church at the altar there. The uh, the Lutheran believes in baptismal regeneration, believes in uh, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, it understands the uh, importance of uh, holding to the sacramental and liturgical tradition of the church and all that sort of stuff. Like we are we are very close in our theology. So. I see that as you can call that ecumenism. Sure. Um, I'm fine with calling it ecumenism. It, it, like it, it makes sense in that context. There are differences that we need to work out, but I don't think those differences cause uh, a need for excommunication of each other. For me, when it comes to uh, whether or not someone can receive communion at my parish, there have to be these standards. The first one is baptized. You have to be baptized. The second one is that you need to have no unconfessed sins. You need to have confessed your sins. Um, and we have a, a, a part of that uh, where we do allow for the confession of sins. Um, then the third part is that we need to uh, confess the efficacy of the sacraments and especially the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And uh, those are the standards I see within scripture, within the uh, tradition of the church. For me, I don't see arguments like, well, we have differences on our eschatology, therefore you're excommunicated. Like, I, I just don't see that uh, within the patristics. Um, I don't see things like uh, uh, you you don't submit to the Bishop of Rome, therefore you're excommunicated. <laughs> I mean, I, you can see some people doing that, but that's not the consensus of the church, I should say. So let me uh, ask this question and it'll be our final question and we're going to take audience questions so i'm just going to put that little banner down there so people this is your opportunity to ask uh questions and please no like snide rhetorical question comments we'll take around three so only the good ones are going to get asked and uh make your final case to the audience why they ought to consider crossing the english channel going that canterbury trail and not the type of this is this okay. is your final word to convince the audience all right, so if you are evangelical and you are not part of one of the liturgical sacramental traditions, I believe that uh, you should definitely check out either Anglicanism or Lutheranism. Um, definitely, I would prefer Anglicanism, and uh, I think that our theology and our uh, uh, liturgical tradition is much better. Uh, for me, the more important thing is that you actually get yourself into a liturgical or and sacramental tradition of the church. And again, for me, it would be preferably Lutheran Anglicanism or Lutheranism. If you are Eastern Orthodox, if you are Roman Catholic, I pray and ask that, well, let me start with the Roman Catholics. If you're a Roman Catholic, um, I'm not necessarily trying to get you to become Anglican. I do ask that you actually look at the communion that you're in and recognize the issues that are within and either work to reform it or leave and, well, become Anglican then. Uh, within the Eastern Orthodox, uh, there's not as much that I would say that I have issues with uh, theologically, although I do have um, some issues with theologically. So I would have the same thing, but a much lesser sort of push on that. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. <laughs> there you go. That, that's the, that's the salesman to become Anglican um, uh, from fa from so Father James. Basically, become Anglican if you're evangelical and if you're. Uh, already part of a liturgical sacramental tradition, see what errors are there and, and work to, to reform within. Yeah. See, I was hoping you say something like, become Anglican, you don't have to LARP. <laughs> right? I just thought that'd be more yeah. amusing. But, like, is, is, is in some degree, like, aren't Lutherans and Anglicans LARPing a little bit as Roman Catholics? Because from what I was told, because um, I'm baptized at ELCA Lutheran back in the day, but from what I was told was that they used to not dress like Roman Catholic priests. Like that's something that kind of came up during the seventies. So, like for example, your your garb you're wearing now is that a sort of LARPing, uh, late twentieth century LARPing, or is that something it, Anglicans have always been wearing? Interestingly enough, it's actually the Romanists who are LARPing us. Uh, the collar is actually a Protestant uh, tradition that was invented. <laughs> and actually, actually, the Presbyterians, Church of Scotland, actually did it. Uh, so uh, we're all LARPing the Presbyterians. 
You know, <laughs> Father James, touche. So look at it. So pretty much you're taking back what was yours. Yeah. Just, just like I've taken back the interesting hats, the, the Anglicans are taking back what was originally the Protestants. Now, I'm really working hard to find uh, these questions. I can't, you know, guys, I'm sorry, but I can't go through this whole thing. So unless you ask them now, I ain't going to find them. All right. And so um, let's see what we have here. And also, yeah. apologies. I have, uh, I've got. I'm just recovering over a cold. So if I've been snorting into the microphone, I apologize. No, I think you've uh, come across very eloquent in this. And uh, if anything, I'm the one who's probably come across a little subdued um, due to kid having a fever. Please pray for my son and all that. We have here from Ashwin. I've heard that Anglicans believe in the inspiration of holy tradition. Is that true? I'm not sure that even the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholics would say that they believe in the inspiration of holy tradition, right? Well, I could give you the definition that St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite gives, which is okay. tradition has certain determined, like, for example, the ecumenical councils. Uh -huh. They're superintended by God. The Deuterocanon is superintended by God. Okay. So, for example, the book of Isaiah, the, when an apostle's writing... That's literally thus saith the Lord, right? That's God speaking through the agency of the person. Superintendence is the person speaking, and God essentially orchestrates the event so that what he wants them to, to come up on their own is really what shows up in the documentation. Yeah. So um, superintendence would be a kind of inspiration that the Orthodox believe in. I don't know if I would call that inspiration, uh, but... I like just you know the distinctions being made are, are what they are. That's fine. Um, I would say yeah. I mean, for instance, the Nicene Creed, uh, like we we hold to it as sort of virtually just you know infallible. We don't we don't want to correct. And yes, I know filioque. We can talk about it some other time. I actually sympathize. Uh, actually, within the um, uh, prayer book tradition, there's been a development in which we are allowing the uh, creed to be said without the filioque. Uh, and I actually prefer that. But yeah, no, like the, the, uh, the, you know, the creeds, we don't sort of change or anything like that. Again, caveat of the filioque. Uh, we, uh, we recognize that the consensus of the fathers is something that we don't just sort of toss out. So that's why we have the threefold ministry of, uh, you know, bishop, priest, and deacon, et cetera. Well, but why can't you toss it out? You you know why can't you have like a new a new uh, like you know uh, John Henry Newman thesis? They all oh, just they're all wrong and developed this other thing. Have you seen the other Paul's video about Newman? I cannot. Stop. Um the the one with the the one with the Shamwell. Not Shamwell. No, it's the it's the tape. It's the tape. Yeah, the tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I cannot stand Newman. I find Newman to be horrible, and like I don't even necessarily disagree with like the bare bones I identity of there being development of doctrine. Everyone believes that you, to some extent doctrine has to be developed in some sense, but like they put that on everything, everything. Yeah. It's, I want to clarify this been there on the topic. There's a difference between theological precision and theology yeah. getting more precise, which yeah. anything that's studied gets more precise over time. Right. Yeah. So there'd be a difference between that and actually coming up with new doctrines that are just simple logical consequences of previous doctrines. That's not precision. That's new doctrines. Yep. And uh, I think when the rubber meets the road, you have Newman saying, well, yeah, in the, in the beginning, they didn't actually venerate the saints. That was just a necessary development out of the love of God. Mm -hmm. And so that is something which wouldn't square with orthodox doctrine now you may be like oh maybe that really happened but of course orthodox would never affirm this and and that is for all the you know the crying and saying oh no you know doctoral development doesn't really mean that uh, scholars on newman don't believe that you could read newman's words he wrote in english that's what he meant and so it comes down to it he came up with an epistemology to justify that they have new ideas yeah. simple as oh, that totally. 100%. You know, and, and slap some Newman on it, right? Slap some Newman can't, on it. Can't find your bishop's universal supremacy for centuries? Just slap some yeah. Newman on it. Thank you, other Paul. <laughs> so we had a, another question. Right, come on. Go away. <laughs> so I'm looking for a question. I saw this. What is Father James' uh, viewpoint of Julian Joseph Overbeck? Uh, none. I don't know who that is. 
There you go. That's the answer to the question. The um, let's see. We I said ask a tough question, and so hopefully we'll find one of those. Da -da -da. Here's one. Is John Stott a good representative of Anglican theology? He is more of the sort of evangelical type. And that's been some one of the issues that's happened is that uh, when it comes to like broad a confessional Anglicanism, uh, there are sort of two camps within that. There's the uh, like we could call ourselves Reformed Catholic. I, I would say that I think that would actually be a good title for us as Anglicans. So there are people who focus on the Reformed part and there are people who focus on the Catholic part. Uh, John Stott is much more somebody who would focus on the Reformed part. So I would have some issues with him. Uh, they're going to minimize sort of the uh, importance of the effic efficacy of the sacraments in sort of the same way that uh, like they can latch on to St. Augustine's words on some sort of things, you know. Um, uh, so like I would be um, – I wouldn't hold uh, to a lot of what John Stott holds to, but I'm not going to excommunicate him and say he's not uh, a Christian. Well, that kind of leads me. This is a tough question, mm -hmm. and it uh, leads me to this. Like, you wouldn't excommunicate Mother Superior, right? So he says, mm -hmm. essentially, how is it not immediately a non-starter from a patristic perspective? The church is ruled by a king, uh, well, here a queen, and, you know, and the female stuff... I mean, is there a certain thing where it just seemed like too far off where one could take it serious? Or why would he think such a way of looking at it would be just incorrect? Yeah, so there are a few issues with that. I actually did a video on this, is that a lot of people seem to think that uh, we we have in uh, Anglicanism a pope called the Queen of England. And that's just not the case. <laughs> um, so I'm you, still waiting for her to... to uh, to cancel the parliament and call and make for a new parliamentary election. She has no real power anymore. That that's my point. Yeah. yeah. No, you no, know, no, it's like theoretically so, they could do that, but they're not going to. Yeah. So the monarch of England is in charge of the church of England, which is literally the church within England. Uh, does not have any jurisdiction over anything in any other country that is not under England. So we're the United States. We're not under England. We have we don't ask the queen for anything like that. That's never been a part of the tradition. Um, that being said, as a queen, she is not um, she is not uh, the sort of theological head. Uh, it, it, it goes to the understanding that we have to have a secular ruler and we have to have an ecclesiastical ruler. So the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then, you know, the Queen of England would be sort of the ones to look to within the Church of England. Uh, but she doesn't get to dictate theology. And I um, I don't I don't I'm not aware that there was this rejection of sort of like queens uh, as secular rulers. Is that is that what he's espousing or I mean, I don't think so. Cause we, we for example, the Seventh yeah. Ecumenical Council, Empress Irene. Pretty much yeah. pulled uh, – I think her, she had a son named Constantine or something, but pretty much she was yeah. pulling all the strings in that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean she's a secular authority. So, yeah. All right. So we have um, this question, which is sort of for me, and I'll then pose it to you because that, that way you can give your church's communion's view of the canon. What's your view on the canon as the orthodox understand it, i.e. the inspiration of the apocryphal books? And – I have a uh, video on this called Ma, M-U-H, Epistemic Certainty, Canon Edition. And I read from St. Nicodemus to Hegyrite because most people think that the Orthodox have this highly legalistic, I'd say Roman Catholic view of the canon that roughly equates the Book of Tobit to be completely equal to the Book of, the Gospel of John. Yeah. And the saints don't really say that. You know, it's Roman Catholics go, well, that's what we believe because Council Trent gives this canon. But the canonical church and orthodox church is quite a bit more diverse. Their own canons have different canons of the New Testament and Old Testaments. Uh, we have saints into the 21st century that have 66 book canons. They sometimes even make somewhat bizarre statements like uh, Daniel Sozoyev calls the Deuterocanon non-canonical scriptures. <laughs> so like the scriptures, but they're not canonical. It's, it's difficult, and that's why I want to... I think the easiest way to, to kind of explain it 
without getting into those the 66 book canons, those are 65, those are 67, those are 73, those are 75, etc., would be just to say what St. Nicodemus the Higurite says, which would be those canons with the Duda canon, generally speaking, are superintended by God. They're not written in the same way that other books of the scriptures are written. Now, if you don't like that answer, well, take it up with the saint. Um, he's praying for you in heaven, and your dish is schmuck. Um, so it's this is what he says about it. But because I think our canonical questions quite a bit less precise, it's kind of hard to say. Well, then, does that mean Wisdom of Solomon is inspired in the same way as the Gospel of John? And I don't think you would get that, especially that it's used liturgically. But for example. We would have less of a problem than Roman Catholics with, let's say, Second Maccabees, where the author writes in the end, I wish I did a better job, and if it's not good enough, you know, I'm sorry about that. You know, it's kind of a bizarre way to end a book of the scriptures, right? Being that the guy is apologizing and write it so well. Um, by the way, you people have to understand that that's a way of showing humility. It's not seriously meaning that he wrote some substandard piece of work. It's just the author's voice coming out in the actual book. But that being said, it makes total sense within the superintendent's view of the Deuterocanon. And so I welcome people to read the footnote to the last apostolic canon in St. Nicodemus the Higurites the Rudder because he explains the whole issue. And he also actually then starts talking about the ecumenical councils and how that works. Again, because I don't know if, if I have one contribution the last few years in this online apologetics world, it has been to try to reset the conversation. So when we actually talk about Orthodox doctrines, we're not talking about Roman Catholic doctrines. We're talking about actual Orthodox doctrines, like the ones that the saints actually talk about. And so it's not, it shouldn't be, uh, what's the word? It shouldn't offend people that you're going to find a 19th century catechism from a saint, St. Uh, Filler to Moscow gives a 66 book canon. Also, St. Sebastian Dabovich and his catechism gives a 66 book canon. Then you have uh, St. Uh, Nikolai Zika, who's a Serbian saint, give a 66 book canon. And then you have Father Daniel Sozoyev give a 66 book canon. And I don't say this because I actually, if I were writing myself, would give a 66 book canon. That's not my point. My point is it's not correct to criticize Protestants that they sent out the wrong number for the canon when we got all sorts of saints that use that same number and use and they mean by it the same books. And what a lot of people don't appreciate is where we're different is because we think something used liturgically actually has an important purpose. And just because it's not the proto-canon for to say it's deuterocanonical, that doesn't mean that God has not superintended and this thing is prophetic in a sense just in a qualitatively different sense. Um, so that is something, cert, rarely certain Roman Catholic writers, like we're talking about in the 1700s, have mentioned things like this. So it's not like no, no one else has ever come up with this before. But this seems to me the most consistent way of understanding the this different canons within Orthodox canon law, right? You know, the Council of Trullo has multiple canons. Because you accept Carthage and you accept the Apostolic Canons, and they give different canons of the scriptures. Plus, then you have the uh, Council of Jerusalem, 1672. But, eh, that's enough. We're talking about Anglicanism and whatnot, and we went into that. You could go more detail, ma epistemic certainty, if you want more detail on the Orthodox canonical issue. My recommendations, don't listen to me, don't listen to some schmuck, listen to the saints, read the rudder, it has the answer. So that being said, how about you give some plugs, what you're up to, what your channel's up to, you got more than a thousand subs now, um, so what's going on? Well, do you mind if I talk very quickly about the... Oh yeah, I forgot about that, what's your view of the canon, go ahead. <laughs> I think this is an incredibly important thing because, okay, you probably just blew a lot of the of your Eastern Orthodox listeners' minds with what you said. You, may, you might have. Uh, but I hope not. It's not the first time I said it. But. but let me maybe blow their minds a little bit more. So within the historic Protestant tradition, we utilize the Deuterocanon. We actually fully utilize it. Um, if you look at Article 6, you have... Uh, third book of Estrus, fourth book of Estrus, book of T uh, Tobias, book of Judith, uh, the rest of the book of Esther, the book of Wisdom, Jesus the son of Sirach, Baruch the prophet, 
the Song of the Three Children, the story of Susanna, of Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manassas, the first book of Maccabees, the second book of Macca uh, Maccabees. That is all as part of our deuterocanonical text. Now, that's not the kicker. The kicker is this. Within the books of homilies, which are part of our official confessional doctrines, uh, standards, there are a variety of times, there are many times, where the deuterocanonical books are cited within the homilies themselves. And a few times they are cited as inspired by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit spake these things. So the book of Tobit, uh, Wisdom of Solomon is, is mentioned in that as well. Uh, just two examples are off the top of my head. So we're actually really high in our understanding of the Deuterocanon. And in fact, that, that goes even higher than what uh, some of what you were just espousing uh, with the idea, uh, like you would keep it, I guess, just short of calling it inspired. Uh, we, well, I, I would uh, call it inspired. It's just it's quali it's a qualitative difference in yeah. the form of inspiration. Yeah. So the theology that we have within uh, concerning the De the Deuterocanon is that what we say is that you cannot derive theology from it alone. That's the the reason. And then part of that has the fact that the uh, these are the books that have doubt as to their canonicity within the consensus of the church. So what we would say is the sixty six book canon has a sort of consensus. Uh, within the church, like very few people are, you know, I mean, there are outliers, obviously, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think, for instance, St. Athanasius did not accept uh, Esther as, as a canonical book or proto-canonical book. But uh, you see a large consensus on the 66 book canon uh, with very few uh, exceptions. And when it comes to our deuterocanon, this is the deuterocanon we've received. So what we're saying is, well, this is sort of, there, there's doubt to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to have that as a secondary source. So, yeah. I just said that. Actually, I forgot I was going to add on that question. It's a, uh, it, it's an interesting thing. As an Orthodox Christian, I have to say we don't need to slice and dice if somehow something's qualitatively different. Inspiration doesn't mean you don't cite it. We cite the fathers all the time. The fathers for the Orthodox settle issues, right? The the Creed settles issues. The Ecumenical Council settles issues. The Wisdom of Solomon could settle issues. So it's. It's more of like a Western hang-up where it's like, oh, it's an epistemic out. Well, if it's not the tippy-tippy top, then it's questionable, right? And that's kind of yeah. comes from Roman Catholicism. Well, if it's not like ex cathedra from the Pope, then, you know, yeah, you know, we could have taught the death penalty for years or we could have taught uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Theotokos an original sin for years or whatever. But uh, yeah. until that ex cathedra statement's made, it's all negotiable. And the way the Orthodox approach tradition, sacred tradition, the scriptures and the fathers, they're just they're this one harmonious whole. You you don't set them against each other. There's qualitative differences, right? Like a father writing his opinion is not God literally speaking, like thus saith the Lord, but that doesn't mean we don't quote the father and we don't find him authoritative. Because we don't view um, the fathers as in contradiction to the scriptures. So it's just that yeah. whole orthodox approach doesn't work with that hierarchical approach, which is so common to how I think the West approached theology. Yeah, we call it, in the West, we call it the Cartesian hangover. <laughs> well, yeah. Because of Descartes, because yeah. it, it comes from Descartes and, like, uh, and Kant, too. Uh, I mean, that sort of... Uh, the, the wake of the Enlightenment that you never the, fully got, in the, yeah. you know, I in got because I'm in America, but in the Eastern tradition, never fully got. Yeah, and I, I'm actually I just got uh, somebody on Path, Path Pathos or whatever that uh, that website is Pathos or Pathos or whatever it's called. Uh, someone a Roman uh, a Romanist uh, responded to one of my videos about Sola Scriptura. And what's he doing? The Cartesian certainty question of like, well, where do you get the uh, canon of scripture if you're Sola Scriptura and all that sort of stuff? I'm like, I don't need epistemic certainty. On, on like absolutely every single detail. It's you should watch my video on my epistemic story just for the title. <laughs> well, to so that being said, start plugging your stuff. What are you up to? I mean, I am doing my stuff on uh, YouTube, which is the main stuff that I have, which is uh, YouTube channels doing videos explaining uh, the sacramental liturgical tradition, uh, explaining Anglicanism, our theology, uh, fighting back against mix misconceptions. I've been doing a lot of apologetics, uh, defending ourselves against Roman claims about us. Uh, so, you know, just your, your typical stuff. Henry VIII wanted a divorce and all that fun stuff. 
So if you're interested in Anglicanism, if you're interested in learning more about us, and uh, even if you're not interested in becoming Anglican, but just want to learn more about us so that you could better critique our theology, please just watch my channel, subscribe. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm wanting there to be more uh, historic Protestant uh, voices out there because I, I see the big channels like Matt Frad uh, on, on the Roman side, and I see the big channels like, you know, Cameron Bertuzzi on the evangelical side. And I'm just like here in the middle between both of them. And I'm like, guys, like you both are wrong <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so I, I'm wanting to have bigger voices out there of historic Protestant theology, that, which I believe goes to the consensus of the fathers. But that's obviously another debate. <laughs> and we get the debate one day, though. I, I'm planning on retiring from the debating business. And so it's a... Uh... I might be pulled out of retirement like that guy in Gladiator, but not doing it with regularity. But uh, that being said, my plug would be if this has blessed you, you've learned new things, you found this really compelling um, and interesting, to go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. It's scrolling on the bottom, orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate to help support the Church of Cambodia who have lost their donors, which were mainly Russians, due to financial sanctions. They can't get money from Russia. So now English-speaking people pretty much are the majority of their donors. And so I'm just trying to get awareness, uh, raise awareness for their needs, and be a – it's a marathon, not a sprint. So try to give consistently a small amount every month. If you could give a lot, of course, give a lot. But even something like $1, $5, fast for a meal, dedicate the fast to the evangelization of the Cambodian people, and you could donate the 5 bucks you saved to the church there so it could be used to print out tracts. It could be used to pay for the seminary education of newly illumined John, who will be going to seminary in Thailand. He's a Khmer person, Cambodian that means who's been converted to Orthodox Christianity, and their hope is to make him a deacon, at least for now. And so, generally speaking, converts are made when you start converting locals that become clergy, and then they make converts. That's how the Orthodox Church has grown quite a bit in Thailand, for example. And so, we need to start that process in Cambodia, and the eternal ramifications will be tangible, but we need financial support. Because those churches need about fifteen hundred dollars each a month just to keep running, and they keep the parishes running, keep the pay the priest, the 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 pay to keep the lights on, and all that stuff that they need. And so we need to support, and that is orthodoxchristiology.com slash donate has the PayPal. Every single penny goes to the Church of Cambodia. It also has the bank wiring instructions if you do in, uh, international monetary transfer. Though I recommend that if you're doing a somewhat large amount. And there's the contact information for the parish priest. You could speak with them. They're fluent in English. And that's pretty much it. So those are my plugs. So any other last words, Father James? Well, I just saw a new question, uh, Jeremiah K. Would, you, would Father James consider Western Rite Orthodoxy? No, I have no reason to leave Anglicanism, and I have every reason to stay here, although I do love Western Rite Orthodoxy. I've been to Western Rite Orthodox parishes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but also... Uh, sorry, I, I, I always forget this one part of my plug, if that's okay. Uh, Go right ahead. Uh, it's Barely Protestant is the YouTube channel. Um, I do have a Patreon, and I am trying to start something like I talked before about sort of having a bigger presence. Uh, I'm talking with other YouTubers who are Anglican or Lutheran about doing stuff like that. Um, I would rather, though, you help churches that are in need. So support your own church first, support uh, Cambodia as well, if you feel led for that. But then as a third tier, if you believe that what I'm doing is important, uh, please consider contributing. Well, and, and the link to uh, Father James' YouTube channel is below, and I presume the link to the Patreon is there. Um, so okay. please consider that. And so um, I guess I'll end it there. It's, it's been a lot of fun. I think uh, this interview will give people at least something to think about, a different perspective, a different paradigm. Instead of being so locked into their own, they think there's no other way people could possibly think other than themselves. So I'm very appreciative that you've presented that for us. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me on very much. Thank you. So I am, uh, it's great having you on, and I'll end this show as I end all of them by quoting Jesus Rock, who said, Fight to the death for the truth. The Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a great day. Blessings. Peace.